Okay. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's meeting of the Young Experts Seminar at IASI. Today's seminar is uh, online only. It's also promoted by IEEE Control System Society Seminar Series Road to CDC 2024. Our speaker is Muhammad Zakwan from the Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne. Uh, Zak uh, um, got his Bachelor of Science from the Pakistan Institute of Engineering and Applied Science and uh, an Electrical and Electronics Engineering degree from Birkent University in Turkey. And he is currently, he is currently a PhD candidate and doctoral assistant at uh, APFL in the Dependable Control and Decision Group uh, under the supervision of Professor Giancarlo Ferrari Trecate. Uh, today, he will uh, talk about physics consistent machine learning and uh, a neural ODA perspective. So we are ready to welcome uh, Zach to, this, uh, to the yes at the ASI stage. So please, you can start. Okay, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. So the topic that we choose today is like physics consistent machine learning and a neural ODE perspective. On the background, you can see our beautiful campus at EPFL. Free, you are, uh, feel free to come and visit it. Okay. So before uh, diving into the results, I would like to acknowledge my team. So all the results that I will present today, most of them are part of my PhD, but uh, with a lot of different collaborations uh, crossing different groups. And also, I'd like to acknowledge my professor, Gian Carlo Ferrari Tricate, who is the main driving force behind all the ideas for the polishing and making is a complete uh, set, uh, result. And also, I would like to acknowledge my funding agencies, which is like NCCR Automation and, and SNSF. So this is kind of a group that is composed of four different universities, like ETH, and a lot of different professors, postdocs, and PhD working towards a green future. Okay. So we all are familiar with the, uh, the recent success of the neural networks, and they have shown a remarkable performance, starting from the system identification to natural language processing, which we call LLMs, and also to speech recognition from our phones to image classifications problems, such as in OCRs that people might use for, like for example, uh, for the recognition of number players in your car. And recently, more recently, uh, neural networks found their applications in autonomous cars and robotics, so basically into the uh, realm of dynamical systems. And we cannot also unsee the recent hype created by ChatGPT4 and BAD AI. So these are large language LLM models that are quite uh, being used today for uh, many different purposes. And also the, the recent, you can say, boost in the number of publications and the specific journals in the scientific community is also an evidence that uh, neural network you cannot uh, ignore anymore and it's kind of a big part of the research and for the both practitioners and the researchers. But however, uh, neural networks are physics agnostic, so we will see how we can make them more practical and uh, for uh, good for the applications. Okay, so as I said, neural networks are physics agnostic. It means that neural networks are very brittle. So usually they do exactly what we tell them. So for instance, a couple of years ago, like there was an algorithm by Google called AlphaGo, which uh, beat the top of the chain uh, players in, the, in this game. But however, more recently, uh, an immature trick uh, by a human just uh, beat the whole system. So it means that how brittle these kind of uh, large uh, language or like large artificial models can be. Another thing that, uh, is like, uh, that is a kind of phenomena observed in the machine learning or your networks is called the shortcut learning, is that neural networks always try to find the data in unexpected ways. So for example, consider this example where we can see an X-ray image where the neural networks has been trained on these X-ray images to identify the cancers in the patients. So they trained the, the whole system on a, a large data set and got the very high accuracy. And after training the neural network, when they check the features that have been used for uh, using the for identifying the cancer, they realize that the neural network looks at the corner of the image. But however, in the reality, it was nothing but a hospital-specific token. So essentially, what the neural network was trying to do is to assign the probability that the person has a cancer based on just on the hospital-specific token, rather than really looking into the picture and finding the feature that responds to the cancer. 
So therefore, it raises issues for the physical system because of the physics agnostic. Consider this uh, GIF. Uh, so the idea is that you have some uh, finite data from the very simple example of simple pendulum with some damping. So we can see that the neural network was able to fit into the data that was provided, but however, it failed to extrapolate uh, the trend and cannot be therefore used for example control design and analysis that we are more interested in. So of course there are a lot of uh, different heuristic methods considering the gravity of the problem such as people have proposed recently called physics promoting regularizers where you can use these regularizers to promote physics in the in the neural network in order to achieve some desired properties but however there are no rigorous guarantees and in today's talk I will Right. At least my hope is to I will try to convince you that we can provide some rigorous guarantees based on the tools that we have developed uh, in our lab. So uh, today's, as I said the, the, in the title, that we will consider the neural OD perspective. So I will give you a brief introduction about a neural OD is. So a neural OD is basically a continuous depth neural network model defined by these three equations. So you have, for example, the input. So it's basically the initial condition of this dynamical equation. So you have a nonlinear dynamical equation and you have an output equation defined at a certain time capital T. So this is the, the horizon of the neural OD. And then this uh, X represents the input. So it can be an image, it can be a data point, it can be anything that you, for example, like speech. And here the things that uh, the parameters that are in the blue are parameters so it means that you can learn them by optimizing uh, some kind of a loss function. So this is what we in the middle we call the neural OD and uh, this is nothing but if you just look carefully and do a forward Euler uh, distribution with some step size h it becomes the uh, forward equation so this is called the forward equation of a neural network where you have the trainable parameters appearing here and then you have step size and uh, this represents the how the uh, uh, neural network is doing in the forward propagation. Okay, so which is very equivalent to the well-known uh, ResNet that have been used uh, to, since 2016 and in many different applications. So what why neural OD? So the the answer is that it allows us to incorporate first of all the prior knowledge. So choosing a specific F we can incorporate or embed prior knowledge in the, the neural OD. And plus, we, as a control engineer, it helps us to borrow tools from the system theory for analyzing the properties of these neural networks. Okay. So today, uh, we will talk about some of the properties that uh, when trust for being a practitioner in control engineering or as a researcher. So we'll talk about five of them in this talk, which is energy conservation. So the idea is that how we can design neural ODs where we can conserve the energy of the system, so the, the, the learned system, also how to uh, preserve contraction. Uh, I will go into the more details. Uh, similarly, passivity, where we can see that uh, passivity is a property of a dynamical system with respect to the input and output that the system is not generating energy itself, but uh, the, 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 the rate of change of the uh, energy is always less than the supply power. And also, we will uh, delve into thermal dynamics, and uh, finally, uh, I will introduce, uh, as mentioned in my abstract, that uh, recently a tool that we developed to identify LTI systems uh, that are stable by design. Okay. So, and our goal would be the unifying goal with all these properties is to perform uh, unconstrained backpropagation. So, we would like to embed these properties into the neural networks for the desired applications, but we also don't want to change the standard way of training the neural network and uh, such as uh, forming unconstrained backpropagation. And the idea is that, and the answer to this question is that you, we can do free parameterizations of the neural OD. And this is uh, where our group is trying to contribute in the literature, this free parameterization of the neural ODs to achieve the desired property. Okay. So we start with the energy conservation. So and when somebody uh, says energy conservation, the first thing that comes to the mind is that Hamiltonian systems. And Hamiltonian systems is nothing but described by this dynamical equation. So where you have the, the, the vector field is defined by a gradient flow and a skew symmetric map J and H here is the energy function. So we can see here that these are the level sets for different energies and along on these level sets, the energy is conserved. So why Hamiltonian systems? 
So consider that if you want to do this uh, stable forward propagation and consider that this, we, uh, this a, H is time invariant, then we have these uh, figures. So this basically represent the, the, the phase portray of three different uh, dynamical system, where in the first we can see that we have an unstable system, uh, where if you initialize uh, in this neighborhood, you will see that all the trajectories are diverging. And if you have a stable system, then for the same initial conditions, we are converging to the equilibrium point. But however, for the stable, simple stable system, we uh, stay on the, the on the level set of the of initial conditions. So it becomes like for the typical examples, for example, you have a lossless oscillators and uh, uh, systems that don't have damping. So something like that. Okay. So, and then our contribution was to, to consider these Hamiltonian systems and then uh, develop neural networks that stems from the discussion of these Hamiltonian systems. So, for example, one can consider the Hamiltonian function, which is written in this form, and then we can set these k and b as the trainable parameters, so they are unknown to us. And then if you can go back and write the, the dynamical equation for the Hamiltonian system, then again you have a skew-symmetric map, j, appearing at the front, and then uh, the partial h by uh, the uh, h by partial y here in this case is given by this uh, this expression, and then we choose sigma such that the derivative of this sigma tilde is nothing but well-known activation functions that have been used in the literature so far. So, for example, now we call this thing, uh, this equation, the dynamical equation, as a neural OD because. Uh, by neural, so we have a neural network structure appearing in the in the uh, vector field of this dynamical equation. So now, how to derive uh, the deep neural networks from this neural OD is pretty much straightforward. That you do this transition, such as I'm considering two uh, schemes here. The first one is a forward Euler, and the second one is uh, uh, some implicit Euler method. For the first case, we can see that it is very straightforward to write. It's an explicit expression, and here. Each J represents a layer in a neural network. So for example, you can make J from zero to capital N. So that would be the depth of your neural network. And this would be your forward equation to uh, calculate the next uh, values of the layer. And similarly, if uh, we assume that, okay, Y is, uh, like, uh, is in Rn by two, so it's an even number, we can split into two different uh, quantities, P and Q, referring to the momentum and the position. And then if you consider J to be uh, smith, uh, constant across all the layers, so we assume uh, remove the time invariance here, we can write uh, this uh, the architecture using some implicit Euler. However, one can see that uh, we have uh, like implicit expression, so we, the, the, the PJ plus one is appearing on the both side of the equation, but of course there are some tools where you can use these simple tricks to choose J to be like this, uh, the, uh, block structure and the k to be block diagonal and then we can get rid of the uh, implicit and then it becomes an explicit expression which can be implemented very easily in the standard tools of the machine learning. So our so this, we were not the first one to come up with this idea. There were like few uh, different uh, results before us was like for example the Hamiltonian like uh, neural networks and anti-symmetric DNNs and uh, the, however the 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 contribution was that we have more degree of freedoms and we have a precise definition of the energy function and also our framework encompasses both of the framework as a special cases. So this was kind of a unified framework as compared to the previous one. Of course, uh, the, the natural question that arises is that, okay, we have some nice properties in the system, it is energy conserving, but are you still uh, a universal approximator? Because the, the reason that people are using neural networks is that such that they can approximate any nonlinear function, continuous function, and then uh, this uh, property is, uh, uh, you can say, represented by UAP, universal approximation property. So the definition is pretty much standard that uh, you have a continuous function, and then uh, you have a neural network map, G, so from the input to the output. And, uh, and we say that uh, if this uh, supremum over the compact space uh, omega is less than some epsilon, then you are basically have, the, then the neural network uh, G uh, has the universal approximation properties. And then these uh, properties have been studied well enough for the shallow neural networks by the famous researchers back in 80s by Sabanko, Hornick, and Pincus. But however, research on the approximation capabilities of deep neural networks is still ongoing. In the same vein, 
we contributed recently to see if we have, uh, are we losing the generalization or we are still universal proximator. So we have this, again, the same architecture as before, uh, which is very similar to H2DNN that I showed you on the previous slide. And uh, here is a, our main result that we said that, okay, consider this HTNN, so Hamiltonian Deep Neural Network, with uh, initial condition uh, in this form, so where you have xi and zero, so the, the first uh, part of the uh, portion of the state is um, you give as i and for the second you give the zero and then we showed that the restrictive flow basically from xi to uh, the, the state qn has the uap on uh, on omega on this compact set and then the the things that to be noticed here is that uh, we do feature augmentation here so basically you are trying to present everything in r2n and uh, also, we get the, uh, we do a symplectic integration. So this expression is again symplectic, integ uh, symplectic implicit uh, expression, and uh, again using the similar tricks that I showed you before. One can also make the make them explicit, and the properties still hold. So uh, what are the applications for all this uh, HDNs? Is that you can either use for image classification. And then in that case, we guarantee that we do not have the vanishing gradients. Uh, it's a phenomena that happens in the machine learning where you have a deep neural network. And if the gradients that you compute while calculating the, while doing the backpropagation is small, then the training stops prematurely. And then we guarantee that if you use HDNN, mm -hmm. since it is energy conserving, the gradients of the, of the deep neural network will also conserve, and then you can train deep neural network. And the second application is that, of course, if you have uh, the uh, underlying system, there's a black box, and the underlying system is a Hamiltonian system, then you can use this, uh, this framework to also learn the dynamics of the system as a Hamiltonian system, for example, pendulums and lots of mechanical systems uh, that you can uh, identify. So I would uh, give the, the, the image classification problem here. So consider that you have a binary classification and then you have a deep neural network given in this way. And the idea is to uh, differentiate between the reds and the blues. And we can see that it achieves the, the partition at the end. And we also perform some uh, different experiments on different data sets such as Swiss roll and double moons, which is given on the, on in this side of the slide and we showed and compared with other Hamiltonian inspired uh, deep neural networks and that we are performing better than uh, for the same number of parameters, almost the same number of parameters, we are performing way better than the Hamiltonian inspired. Okay. Also, the applications are not limited to the simple binary classification. You can also do it image classification. And then for, uh, we did for an MNIST, it's a standard benchmark in the machine learning community that you have uh, 28 by 28, so these are the uh, dimensions of the pixels, and uh, our sample is given on the on the top right of the slide. And the idea is to differentiate that uh, if you given this number, you have to tell if it's zero or one. And then we chose this architecture where in the beginning you have a convolutional layer, and then you have a Hamiltonian deep neural network in the middle, and finally you have a fully connected layer. And then we compared our results with the again with the state of the art. And we showed that we perform better than, uh, than or either almost the same. Okay. So now uh, we'll consider contraction, uh, how to preserve contraction in neural OD. For this, first of all, I would like to introduce the notion of contraction, what it is. So contraction is nothing but uh, the property of a dynamical system for which the trajectory satisfies this expression. So we have, uh, there exist two positive constants, C and rho, such that this inequality holds. So the idea of the contraction is that you are trying to forget your initial conditions. Basically, these are a bit, uh, exponentially fast. So why, uh, and our claim is that this contraction can also promote robustness in the neural network. For that, I will give you a very simple 2D binary classification task. So imagine that you have this task to uh, distinguish between the blue and the red points. Uh, we have three of both of them. And then if you train a simple neural OD where you don't have any contractive dynamics, and if you train, so this panel on the left uh, hand side shows the, the train neural OD, where this is the, the line that is separating between them is the classification boundary. And then the color on the background is uh, representing the output of the neural network. So basically everything in the red would be considered as the, uh, the red point and uh, everything that is here would be considered as the blue point. So, but however, if you plot the output space of the same train neural OD and you add some perturbation, 
uh, we can see that a small perturbation around the nominal point is mapped on a, this uh, elongated ellipsoid. And for some of the points in this ball, this ellipsoid crosses the classification boundary, which is given in the green, and then will be misclassified. So this leads to that smaller perturbation, so large output space, and then you have, this leads to basically the small classification margins. But however, on the other hand, if you have a contracting neural OD, we can see that the perturbations around the nominal points are either remain the same or is decreasing over the time. So, and then you can see that if you again plot the classification boundary, uh, we can see that uh, we have more margins, which is the summary here. So we have now smaller perturbation leads to smaller outputs, and then you have boundary with uh, larger margins, which can also be observed in this in this figure over here. So, and how to uh, guarantee that we can have contraction in the neural OD? So we came up with this idea of a contractive Hamiltonian neural ODs, where imagine that you are given this dynamical system, where again uh, all the uh, parameters in the blue are trainable, so they are unknown. And uh, here we choose this again sigma as an activation function. We assume that it's differentiable for some uh, constant s. And uh, if we can uh, see the, com uh, you can say if you want to see the similarity between this and the previous framework, that this part here represents the, the partial H by partial uh, xi, so the, the gradient of the Hamiltonian. And then the only additional part is considered here is the damping, which is uh, given by this gamma. And our result is the following, which seems to be convoluted, but I will go step by step. So imagine that you are given a skew symmetric matrix, a constant J, and a positive constant kappa, and then you have this neural OD, right? So one can compute uh, all these constants, C1 and C2 and alpha, which is based on the maximum or either minimum eigenvalues of the product of these matrices. And then if this epsilon is such that this expression holds, then choosing the damping good enough, which is more than this expression, renders the neural ODs contracted by design. So what do we mean that given any trainable parameters, K, B, L, so in the state space, uh, sorry, in this space, and we can always choose a gamma such that the whole dynamics are contracted. That's the idea. And the training of this neural ODE is very uh, easy, like the standard way. So what we do is that we do a forward propagation through the C node and CH node, and then with the current values, the initial values of gamma and the weights, and then we calculate the training loss. And this training loss can be very arbitrary. It can be a regression problem. It can be a classification problem. So we calculate this loss, and then again with the standard tools of machine learning, we do the backpropagate to update the weights, and finally we update the values of C and C2 for the new weights that you just updated, and we update our gamma and epsilon. And uh, the, interestingly, there are many applications of this framework, is such, for example, two of them, is that if we know that the underlying dynamical system is contractive, we can also use this to uh, train uh, to identify the dynamical system. And also, as I mentioned before, we can use this framework to do robust image classification. So what do we mean by robust classification? I can explain it with a nice example. Again, consider the problem of the image classification of MNIST data set. But now where we have corrupted the, the test data uh, with Gaussian noise and the salt paper noise. Here, uh, the, uh, the sigma represents the variance of the, the Gaussian noise, zero mean Gaussian noise. And for the salt paper, it uh, corresponds to the amount of pixels that can be uh, changed either as a white pixel or the black pixel, which can also be seen from these figures. So here I have some examples. You have the nominal uh, test data, and then you have uh, this corrupted data with different uh, values of sigma. So as you can see, if you take a 0.2 here, so it means that this 20% uh, of the pixels are either chosen as a black or the white one. So, and uh, we did experiment, we trained up a neural OD for 10 different ID experiments. And for the comparison purposes, we chose the standard ResNet. And again, to see that uh, the, the, the robustness is coming from the uh, damping. So we also compared with the HDNS that I, I showed you before. And then here, the uh, our framework is represented by CHNN. And the results are tabulated here, where in the first column, we have the number of layers in the, for the neural network. And this is the architecture. And we have the nominal accuracy, so basically on the train, which is on the training data, and then we do the testing data. And uh, remember that the testing data is not being uh, has not been seen by the neural network yet. 
and then we have the accuracies on the corrupted uh, data set. We can see that uh, although we lose some, uh, you can say, expressivity in this case because of the contraction, since everything is uh, contracting to a uh, unique equilibrium point, and then, but however, we can see the effect of this in the, in the noisy cases. So overall, we, we in, from this experiment, we, we can claim that the contractivity might bring the improvement from 15 to 50% of uh, in the test accuracies. So uh, moving on to the, to the next uh, uh, property is passivity. For this, I will choose a framework uh, of the nonlinear systems called the Port Hamiltonian systems. Uh, Pornell Hamiltonians uh, can represent multiphasic systems and uh, their application can range from a simple pendulum to electrical circuit motors like process, robotics, non homomic agents such as given hair or robot, claims to industry 4.0. So more formally, uh, by the way, this uh, notion was introduced by Aryan van der Schaaf and uh, the details of these uh, kind of systems are given in this book. But more mathematical or formally, uh, Port Hamiltonian system is uh, nothing but given by this dynamical equation. And here, x is our state, and j is again an skew-symmetric map, and we call in this term, in, in this framework, the interconnection matrix. And r is a positive infinite matrix called uh, the, the damping matrix, so it determines the damping of the system. And h is again the Hamiltonian of the system that I just showed before. But however, if you compare this framework with the previous one, but now we have additional B and U as the, as the input to the system, right? So you have input matrix, which might depend upon the state or can be a constant, and then finally you have the input. For people who are not familiar with this framework, system, we can compare that the first part uh, here corresponds to the AX, and then you, you have B and U. So this is kind of how it relates to the simple LTI case. And uh, and the nice thing about this whole framework is that the the system we can by looking at just the structure of the system, if this R is positive, so if this R is uh, exists, uh, then the system is passive by design. So it means that for all choice of tenable parameters, for all choices of H and B and J and R, given that it respects uh, this uh, skew symmetric and R the system is passive, which means that the rate of change of energy of the system is always less than input supply power, which is the product of your u and uh, y. So the y is basically the output of the equation, which is uh, not mentioned here. Uh, okay, so now how to do the free parameterization. So the idea is that you have two constraints the, for the skew symmetric and the positive definite, but which is very simple to implement in a, in a free parameterization setting where we can choose two matrices, any uh, uh, Q, and the, the, and the product is uh, R, which is a positive semi-definite. We can also add some epsilon to make it strictly positive definite. And then we can also parameterize J as a difference between a lower triangular matrix L with this transpose. So now if we have that, and uh, then we can train again uh, uh, this is again a neural OD, so if you make all these uh, parameters as trainable, and then the applications line again, you can design uh, neural network controllers, you can also learn passive dynamics. So we can identify this, uh, this unknowns, basically H, R, and J, and B from the data. So in this presentation, I will go with the neural network design because it, uh, we know from the theory that if the two dynamical systems interconnected, are passive, then the overall system would be passive. So in this case, we have to preserve the passivity of the controller. So imagine that you have this navigation task where you have 12 robots given on the top right corner. And then our goal is to uh, uh, do the swapping. So basically, every robot will change its position from, the, from this uh, opposite uh, robot in this way. And then uh, our idea is that uh, we assume that, OK, there is a pre-stabilizing controller. But on the top of that, we design a Hamiltonian one. And of course, the robots have to achieve this task while uh, avoiding the collisions. So if you see the open loop performance of the system, which is given in this uh, orange box, so they also do collide in the middle. And then there you have a lot of overshoots. But then if we can train, uh, then if you can train our passive controller, and then we can see that uh, the, the agents are able to do this task very nicely and reach their uh, destinations without uh, colliding. And in this case, we preserve the, the passivity 
uh, in our neural network controller, which is basically a neural ODE by design. So for all trainable parameters, which is basically given here. So we can do the training, uh, pre-stop the training at any point of the, of the whole, EPO, uh, you can say the training episode. And however, if you see that even with the 25% of the training, uh, we might not be able to achieve the best optimal performance, but we are not losing any uh, stability while doing so. So this is where uh, application is that we can, we want to preserve the passivity while designing neural network controllers. And the, the, the fourth uh, uh, property that I would like to discuss is called the thermodynamics. It's very interesting in the sense that, the, for example, if you can recall the previous framework of the Bohr Hamiltonian models, we can see if you set uh, u and r equal to zero, then if you write the equation for the rate of change of energy, you have this expression, and then thanks to the skew symmetry of the J, we can show that without damping, the system is conserving the energy. So basically, the energy of the system H dot is equal to zero. But however, uh, now we although we have the energy uh, conservation by design, but however, this is not enough in many real world applications as shown below. So for example, we have systems such as gas system that involves thermodynamics. We have uh, tanks uh, which uh, called the, like the continuous steering tanks, also buildings where we need more than the than just the conservation of the energy. So therefore, we need to respect these laws of thermodynamics, and especially if you want to identify these systems, you have to also guarantee the the that the second thermal uh, law of thermodynamics, which is the reversible creation of the entropy, should be intact. So. It means that now we would like to provide a framework that not only conserves the energy, but however also have the property that uh, the entropy is being created irreversibly. So then we came up uh, with this idea. So the whole thing, uh, this framework is called the irreversible port Hamiltonian models. And uh, uh, they were first introduced by Bernard Mask uh, in this paper in 2013. So the idea is very similar to the one that we had before, but with some uh, subtle differences that I will explain now. So for instance, now you have another function, a uh, scalar function, which is the entropy of the system, and uh, you have some nonlinear disturbances uh, injecting into the state dynamics. And uh, again, we have uh, constant and skew symmetric as before, uh, the J matrix. And now this, uh, the scalar function, if it represents kind of uh, virtual damping of the system, is given by this uh, expression. So this R, uh, which is a function that depends upon the state, the gradient of the Hamiltonian, and the entropy is given by this product, where you have this gamma as a positive scalar function, and then you have this operator, which is called here the Poisson bracket, and the definition of the Poisson bracket is nothing but given as the product written down here. So you have a skew symmetric, the, this Poisson bracket is with respect to the J, and then you have the, the gradient with respect to the entropy, and then you have the gradient respect to the Hamiltonian. So why this uh, framework is interesting is that one can easily show that for uh, input zero, you can write the uh, dynamics for the S dot, and then we can show that uh, this is always positive semi-definite, which corresponds to the irreversible creation of the entropy. So again, we still have the skew symmetric J, so if you write the dynamics for the H dot, you still have the energy conservation as before. So therefore, this framework is consistent with first and the second law of thermodynamics. And our contribution was to use this framework and adapt it according to the machine learning tools. So our main idea that one can uh, easily learn these parameters from the data. And then we formulate this problem in this optimization uh, here. So you have a dynamical system. And then this dynamical system is such that you have uh, two constraints. The first one is, again, the skew symmetry of the J matrix. And the second one corresponds to the that R has this specific structure and where this gamma is a scalar uh, function. And again, one can do the forward Euler discussion to, uh, to, uh, to get the neural network stemming from this dynamical equation, which is very straightforward and written here. And again, that all the parameters or the functions given in the blue color are our trainable parameters and can be uh, represented by a neural network. So you can uh, represent this Hamiltonian as a neural network or this R and J as constant trainable parameters 
or in this case, R is a function which is given as this. So we can parameterize them with the neural networks. So therefore, this kind of framework allows us to incorporate prior knowledge into our training problem. And then yet we can guarantee that the, at the end of the training, what we'll have is uh, obey the first and the second law of thermodynamics by design. So, and we call this whole framework is, uh, which was the title was physically consistent neural ODs, right? And the training problem is very simple as before. So imagine that you have a given a data set where you have n a number of trajectories. So the capital M denotes the number of trajectories that you have. And then you have uh, the each trajectory is of length L and uh, one can use these initial conditions to, to simulate the PC node, uh, this system. And then we can have the states, we can collect all the states. And then once you have the information of all the states, we can compute a desired loss function. So for example, uh, this loss function can be MSE. If we are trying to fit the data, it can also be an MAE. Uh, for example, we, uh, we know that MAE is uh, quite robust to the outliers. So we do not impose any constraint on the loss function in our framework. And uh, once you compute the loss, one can do simple back propagation through time to update the parameters, and then you repeat this process until we achieve the desired accuracy on the test data. So uh, having this framework, we were curious to apply it uh, in the real world example. So we have two examples. The first one is the buildings. So uh, we trained our neural OD to uh, you can identify the dynamics of a building. And the second one is an academic example where the underlying system is a gas piston system. And uh, moving on with the, with the first one. So the goal here is to uh, uh, identify the building temperature dynamics. So we have uh, this building in, uh, in Zurich uh, owned by AMPA. And uh, our goal is that we want to model this uh, entropy of this zone, which is called UMER. So in this framework, uh, we have uh, three rooms that are connected in this uh, way. So where they share walls in this topology. So room one is sharing wall with room two, and room two is again adjacent to the room three. Each room is equipped with a heater that has the ability to either cool the system or to make it hotter. And then you have uh, windows, and because of the windows, you have the effect of the sun. So this is called the solar gain that can affect the internal temperature. And the temperature outside is denoted by this TE, the ambient temperature. And likewise, the temperature in each of the room will be um, denoted by T1, T2, T3, T3 respectively. And then uh, what we did is that we modeled this system as, a, as an irreversible uh, Hamiltonian system. And uh, the idea is that, again, we have like solar gains that are affecting. We have the heating gains from the heaters. And then we also have the cooling gains. And here, for each room, we have this coefficient lambda basically, which determines the thermal coefficient between the rooms. Uh, so we have uh, lambda A1 uh, to lambda 3 for all three rooms for the heating, cooling, and the solar gains. You have the temperature outside affecting the dynamics of the system. Uh, then we have, uh, of course, and you can also, it depends on the temperature difference, So, uh, which is given by this B of T. And uh, this is the most interesting one. So you have the, since we know the topology of the rooms, that how they are connected, we can construct our skew symmetric geometrics in this way. So we can see that the uh, room two is connected with both the first and the third, but here the room one it can only share the information from the two, and uh, as likewise the room three can only share the information with two. So this also allows us to incorporate the prior knowledge that we have uh, into the system. So it makes the training problem easier and more, uh, you can say, close to the actual dynamics of the system. So in this case, it's the, our framework is quite, uh, you can say, uh, you can say, can seamlessly integrate the prior knowledge. And again, we have, we know that uh, since we are trying to modeling the, the entropy of the each zone or the room in this case, so we know that the, the derivative of H with respect to the entropy is nothing but the temperature itself. So, and again, all the, we assume that all the parameters in the blue are unknown and are made trainable parameters in our training problem. So now we fit to the real data. We uh, have the access to the three years of data from the nest. And uh, we compare our uh, neural OD with the classic ARCS model. And then we can see from this, so basically in this figure, we can see that we have temperature of the each room for over the span of, I think, three days. And then we have the, uh, the, uh, the measurements, so the actual measurements uh, are in the black. 
and then us and the PC nodes are given by orange and uh, green respectively. And uh, we can see that over the longer horizons, uh, the C nodes, uh, the PC nodes in this case, can outperform a simple ARC model. And also here we plotted the average accuracy over the three rooms for like a, for a very long horizon, which is uh, like almost the 70 hours. And uh, I would like to in emphasize that why we need this uh, kind of longer horizons is to also we need to tr design a controller such as MPC to design references for the to control the temperature of the room. And for MPC, we know that we have to predict in the future. And if the prediction is quite good enough, uh, we can design better controllers and uh, provide the best experience to the user. So here we can see because of the physical consistency, we can outperform us or like other models in this case, which are not shown here because of the physical consistency. Although us can do quite good in the beginning, but at the end the error compounds and then it diverges. Coming to the second example, it is an academic example. So the model of the system is uh, as already known, using the first ordered uh, principles. And uh, here we have the state of the system, which is like four. We have entropy, the volume of the gas chamber. The, the picture of the whole system is given here in the top of the slide. And then you have uh, the position of the piston, and then you have the momentum. Again, we have an input matrix, and then <clears throat> there are two uh, different matrices. So you have the, <clears throat> the, the damping and the skews matrix, ma uh, matrix here. And uh, we have the friction coefficient. We have the again another skew-symmetric matrix into the uh, in coming into the dynamics, and then here A is the cross-sectional area of the piston. And again, uh, the the Hamiltonian is modeled by this expression with different temperature, pressure, and spring constant, and so on. And uh, however, since we assume that uh, <clears throat> in this case we assume that we do not know the Hamiltonian of the system, so we parameterize this Hamiltonian with a very generic expression uh, here. And uh, the idea is that since uh, we know this expression, we can take the, the Jacobian offline and can directly embed the Jacobian here without calculating it online. So it reduces the computational burden. And according to the simulation and in our past experience, it works really well in most of the applications. And finally, uh, we parameterize. We also assume that we do not know anything about the, the scalar function R. And we parameterize is as a neural network here. You can see where this uh, Sigma is a sigmoidal, so ranging from 0 to 1, so that we make sure that it's always positive. And finally, uh, again, the all things in the blue here uh, are trainable parameters, and we assume that we do not have any information. So in this case, we simulated the data uh, for 10,000 samples, with, and we added noise in the output to make it more challenging. And then the idea was to we can uh, uh, fix the, the data for the, uh, for the position of this uh, pendulum. We can see here that both so basically here the black line is the ground truth and then this is the noisy data that you have and uh, both the pc node and a vanilla neural od which doesn't have any information on the physics of the system can approximate the position very well but if you look carefully since we have the access to the entropy of the system we also plot it here so we can see uh, that the vanilla neural od might uh, not uh, be uh, like for example cons consistent with the recreation irreversible creation of the entropy uh, there is another result from uh, another trajectory. We can again see that it was able to fit the position very well. But however, here the, the entropy clearly fails that it is plummeting after the first two seconds. And however, in our case, we can see that the PC nodes that are physically consistent are uh, is, uh, do not have this phenomenon as in the red one. So these kind of properties, if we have, then we can design reliable controllers on the top of that. That was the whole idea here. So finally, moving on to the stability, this is a very new work and not yet been published. And most probably we will submit this thing in the ECC. And uh, the idea is that we can leverage uh, machine learning tools such as backpropagation to do simple SysID for linear systems that we are uh, familiar from a very long time. So here we have the dynamical equations and we can add some process noise, which is denoted by W and then we have the measurement noise in the output. So our goal is to basically to identify a system which is stable from the data. And we, our solution that we proposed in this, uh, in this uh, method is that we can use machine learning tools, to particularly uh, uh, automatic differentiation from powerful uh, packages such as PyTorch and TensorFlow, 
and pre-parameterization. So we do not have to, you can say, do the projection of the trainable parameters such that we have a stable system. We do not do any kind of constraint uh, uh, optimization here. So most of us are familiar with the stability criteria that for the LTI discrete time system, the stability corresponds to nothing but that the, the A matrix is short. Means that the eigenvalues, all the eigenvalues, uh, it should be the magnitude of the eigenvalues is less than one. So here is a proposition, and our contribution was to have this, uh, you can say, free parameterization such that we can identify some stable LTI system. The proposition says that imagine that you have a trainable parameter in W, so it's like 2n by 2n, so two times more the state of the system, and then you have a V, which is in Rn by n and then exists a positive uh, gamma between 0 and 1, and a sufficiently small epsilon such that you construct this S matrix. And then uh, you can construct A by using this expression here. And then we guarantee that for this A, all the eigenvalues will be uh, in the radius of gamma. Uh, so therefore, uh, also it uh, corresponds to the stability of the system. So there are a lot of other things that we added in this package, but I will not go into the details of that. For example, we can enforce sparsity. We can identify state to output, uh, state, yeah, input to the state, and different kind of, uh, you can say, uh, combinations of different things. But I will give like two examples. So we have this training problem for other Simba that we have some trainable parameters that are unknown, uh, the initial condition and uh, all the A, B, C, D. And uh, we can do some batch. So imagine that you have given a data an LTI system, we can construct batches over that, and then we have the myed output, so from the system, and this is, would be the, the predicted output from the predictor, which is nothing but the given in this uh, dynamical equation, and then we can also incorporate some dropouts. This is to regularize the, the whole procedure. You can either set it to one or zero, depending upon that if you need to regularize the, the whole training problem. and. Uh, what we did is that for now that we generated 50 models randomly from the MATLAB, and then we have, uh, for example, for each of the model, we have five states and the three inputs, three outputs, so we are doing MIMO identification. And then we compare the normalized MSE, so one means the best, uh, with, the, uh, with the state of the art methods for the, for, the, for the system ID, or you can say subspace identification of LTI systems. So we have parsing K that was recently proposed, and CBA, MOSEP, and FIRST comes from the MATLAB, and then also parsimonious structures that were recently developed. So we can see that using the machine learning tools, we can do multi-step uh, prediction identification, and then use machine learning tools such as backpropagate to time in order to identify these dynamics. So in, in, in the classical approaches, this has been assumed to do by having a non-convex problem, and the classical tools uh, to solve these problems were not good enough, but now since we can use the parallelization of the machine learning tools, we can achieve state-of-the-art accuracy. So, by the way, this comparison is with the MATLAB, and we show that almost on or randomly generated 50 models that we are performing way more better than the than the standard MATLAB uh, toolbox system ID toolbox. And similarly, we just uh, didn't stop there, and we went to the the real data set, which is Daisy, a very well-known data set for the for the people who are coming from society might know about this data set. Uh, it's a power plant in France uh, with uh, five inputs and three outputs, but however, the state dimension is unknown. So again, we compared with the two MATLAB methods, which is prediction error method and for SID. So the thing about Simba is that we might assume that the, the initial condition is known or not known. So here we assume that it is known. Uh, there are different kind of variants of Simba, uh, which I will not go into details because it's a whole new topic. But here we can see the, the box and the plots for each of the different uh, methods. And uh, we on the x-axis, we have the states. So we, we, because since it is not known, so we do it, uh, you can say, arbitrarily for all of the states till 8. And then we have the norm normalized MSE. And here one means that uh, this is the, the normalized one. So below the red line means you are better. And above the bell, uh, red line, you means that you are doing the worst. So we can see that the Simba in every case is uh, always the green, and the black one is almost uh, for the order of two to six is performing well, be, well better than uh, the MATLAB toolbox. So the there would be only one key takeaway from this talk is that we can use uh, or leverage uh, neural ODs for doing physics consistent machine learning 
A few examples are shown again here, like for example, contraction, thermodynamics, or the homogeneity of the system. And of course, there are several future extensions that my group is working on. So we are like trying to identify district heating. So where you also have a, dist a big problem, you have a lot of different systems, but we know the topology, so we can incorporate this for our knowledge. And again, we uh, might be able to extend this same idea to biological system where we might need the conservation of mass, for instance. So moreover, uh, we are also trying to uh, develop some framework where we can preserve the finite L2 gain or incremental L2 gains. So we are trying to approximate these operators for all possible uh, trainable parameters and do it in a free fashion uh, without any projections or constraint optimization. Of course, our group works on the control. Uh, this was what I've shown you is the, how to preserve the properties, but we might need these properties as I showed in the controller example, for example, passivity, and you would like to do neural network control and JET provides some stability guarantees and the take, uh, you can, uh, like certificates of safety. This is ongoing work. Uh, you can reach me uh, if you have more questions or uh, so basically I would like to thank my whole team. This is a very nice picture from Grujia in Switzerland. This is our decode group. And uh, this is my email and uh, all the things that I showed you uh, till now is that the codes is, are available open source on the GitHub. And you can also visit our uh, group website for more information on these topics for the references of the papers and everything is provided there. Also, I would like to share the NCCR handles. Uh, they are very interesting, very information, informative for upcoming results from, or you can say from NCCR. And with this, I would like to uh, finish my presentation and open to any question. Thank you very much.